This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I want to ride, ride, ride. Episode 200 of the Roller Coaster will soon be here, and this is your chance to be part of the fun. I'm going to be recording this episode with coaches and listeners just like you. If you want to be part of the fun, head over to NectureGrowth.com. Sign up for free and RSVP for the November 18th event. All of the details will be under the events tab. I can't wait to see you there. What are you waiting for? Come join us. You know you're worth it. When you feel your stress levels rise, are you reaching for a bag of cookies, maybe some chips? Does one emotional encounter, a fight or an argument, does that send you digging in the freezer for a tub of ice cream? Or in my case, a big glass of red wine. Joining me today is Trisha Nelson, an emotional eating expert and author of the number one best-selling book, Heal Your Hunger, Seven Simple Steps to End Emotional Eating Now, to share how you can conquer emotional eating. Hi, Tricia. Hi, thanks for having me, Lucy. Thank you for joining me. You know, we're really good at lying to ourselves, and I do this to myself all the time. I like to, I like to tell myself that I'm not an emotional eater. I don't do things, but you know what? I do. I do. I think a lot of people do. What was the catalyst for you? And, you know, what's been your relationship with emotional eating? Yeah. So I started this a long time ago. So, you know, I think nobody starts out realizing they're an emotional eater. You know, I thought I just liked food. So as a kid, I love to eat. I love to cook. I love to serve food to other people, go out to restaurants. So I was just very focused on food. Um, and I didn't realize it was a problem until I really got tired of struggling with my weight. So I was a yo-yo dieter. I'd be like up 30 down 20 up 10. I had five different sizes of pants in my closet because I never knew what size I was going to be. My, my um, skinny jeans collected a lot of dust while I wild away out, you know, hours and days and years trying to get to the bottom of my weight loss struggles. So basically it was a personal struggle for me. And after trying so many different diets and exercise programs and pills and potions and lotions, I I threw up my hands. I was like, I, you know, I, I can't do this for the rest of my life. And very shortly after that, I met somebody who showed me how to deal uh, with my problem at a whole different level. So really from the inside out and the tagline of my business, heal your hunger is weight loss from the inside out. So um, once I started really addressing the emotional eating piece, which doesn't really get enough, you know, airtime, if you will. So thanks for having me on the show. Basically, people are just running to diets, running to exercise programs like I did, but not realizing that there is an emotional component. So when I started addressing that and the underlying causes of why I was going to the refrigerator five times a night, looking to see if anything new was in there, um, that's when uh, I started to really make progress and was able to lose weight and keep it off. So how do we dig down and get in touch with those emotional reasons that are triggering our eating habits? Well, I think that it is a process. It's a journey. And um, when you, what happened for me when I thought, oh, I just like food. My sister came home one day and she's like, I am an emotional eater. And I thought, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, you know, but after she said it, I couldn't unknow it. So it sort of seeped into my consciousness and and I started to recognize that my eating is different than other people's eating. Like I'd go out to, you know, a restaurant with friends and they'd order a sandwich and it would come with fries and they'd eat their sandwich and pick up their fries. Well, 
I'd eat my fries and pick up my sandwich, you know, like I wasn't going to miss out on French fries. And I'd sit there and th- I'd feel like a Martian. I'd be like, how can they leave French fries on their plate? Like, that's so bizarre. Like that's the best part of the meal. So I real I started to like notice, like my eating is not the same as other people's. And I also noticed that I oftentimes ate when I didn't really have hunger. Like I wasn't really physically hungry, but I was maybe bored or I was nervous or tense or uh, couldn't sleep, you know? And so I'd, I'd, I'd eat. And so eat was sort of, eating was my cure-all. And when I started to realize that, that it's really not the same as other people and it's not physically driven, it's not based on having physical need for food, um, that's when I started to really address it. And to answer your question, it's really important first that we see that it, it's not just, it's not just eating, you know, we don't just like food, that there is something underneath. A lot of people do say to me though, like, oh, I don't eat over my emotions. And I often think to myself, well, first of all, if you struggle with weight for any amount of time, it's in my experience, unless there's some medication you're taking that just makes you crazy around food or makes you, you know, gain weight involuntarily or without overeating, you know, putting that aside, it's, if anybody struggles chronically with food and weight, it's generally an emotional eating issue in my experience. And so I'm starting to realize that there are emotions, but you may not realize it because you're eating, like eating's working, like it's doing its job. If you don't know what, what the emotions are, right? Because we use food primarily for three reasons. One, and I call it the PEP test, you know, and the first, the P, PEP, PEP is a acronym, PEP. So the first P is painkiller. So we use food as a way to kill our emotions, like to kill pain. What kind of pain? Any kind of pain, you know, stress at a job or, you know, a kid that's dysregulated or parents that are, you know, whose health is failing or whatever, you know, uh, there's so many different ways that we feel pain in our lives or we, we are afraid of feeling pain and then we eat to anesthetize that pain. So that's the first P and PEP. The second um, letter E is escape. So we use food as a form of escape. You know, when our reality gets a little too, um, like just a little too much overwhelming, like having financial fear or having an illness or something, and we just want to, you know, having COVID, you know, or, or being in the middle of a pandemic, like that's a good reason, you know, you just want to get away from your reality. So you get your goodies, you sit in front of your TV, you know, your favorite, favorite bingeable show, and you just sort of check out, so we use form, we food as a form of escape. And then the last P and PEP is punishment. So we use food as a form of punishment, which seems counterintuitive because, you know, we usually eat uh, uh, as a reward, like, oh, I've had a hard work week. I'm going to get my goodies, my favorite Belgian chocolate and sit in front of the TV. But the truth is, if we are one that goes overboard and ends up feeling stuffed and gross because of what we ate, we, like we, 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 we miss the mark and we go beyond it. Um, and then we feel bad the next day. We don't want to hang out with our girlfriends because we feel bloated. Um, you know, that's not a reward. Like that sounds more like a punishment. So it begs the question, why do we do that? And my experience, Lucy, is that overeaters are overfeelers and we feel guilty about everything, you know, and we also are really hard on ourselves when we mess up. And so, you know, uh, we use food as a form of punishment, even though it seems like a reward as we set out to eat. So uh, the PEP, using food as a painkiller and escape and a form of punishment. These are some of the drivers um, of emotional eating. And so just sort of, again, waking up to our habits, starting to look at it from a new standpoint, uh, instead of it being, oh, I just, it's my favorite chocolate. What can I say to, you know, maybe, maybe I've got some emotional stuff going on. Maybe, maybe, maybe I don't need this food and maybe it's an emotional um, driver, you know, and what is that? What's really going on? Where am I feeling overwhelmed? Where am I feeling like life's a little too much for me? What can I do instead? This, that's a good place to start. So where in the grand scheme of things, because, you know, in my mind, our weight is determined by, you know, what we put into our bodies and how we move our bodies. So, you know, how do things all sort of blend together? You know, once you're sort of dealing with that emotional side of things you're you're uncovering why you're choosing to reach for the chips or the chocolate um how does exercise and the healthy eating aspect how does that fit into the mix 
Well, my experience is anybody who struggles chronically with food and weight, like they've been on the roller coaster ride for a pardon the pun. <laughs> no pun intended, but right? yes. Uh, like, and, and I'm thinking of myself because um, I started to, you know, you know what? I was doing things in my life. I started packing on the weight. Um, and I've made some changes. I've noticed a little bit of change, but I'm still sort of wondering okay, is there more that I have to dive into? How does diet and extra, not diet as in dieting, but how much is what I'm putting in my body versus how I'm moving it? You know, how do I figure out what's not working for me? Well, what I was going to say regarding the roller coaster ride is anybody who's been on that ride for a while, uh, you know, with regard to weight, um, you know, they're not stupid, right? None of us are stupid. We know that salads are generally healthier choices than pizza. And so uh, it's the question is, if we know so much, because anybody who's been struggling with their weight is studying it, they're reading books, they're buying the diet books. And, you know, if you do a search on Amazon right now for diet books, there's over 60, you'll get over 60,000 results, literally. Wow. Yeah. That's and insane. Yeah, it is insane. And everybody's basically saying the same thing, like, like, like eat good protein, good fats and, and good vegetables. It's like, you know, duh. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so we know what to eat. That's not the problem. We don't need another diet book. We need to know how to follow through on what we know, because when push comes to shove, we want the ice cream. We want the Hershey's kisses, you know, we want the bread. And so where's that coming from? Why are we reaching for that stuff? And why, when we do go on a diet, do we abandon the diet two weeks in, you know, when it gets hard, too hard, like at first it's fun. It's like, I'm doing it like looking good, feeling good, pants getting looser. This is so awesome. And then after two weeks, you're like, this sucks, you know, <laughs> this sucks. it's too much work. <laughs> yeah. Like screw it. You know, I'm and okay then we wearing go, track pants. <laughs> exactly. Yoga pants. So, you know, and then we give it up. And so what's that about? Why does it get hard? You know, what's the self-sabotage, you know, lever what's going on there. And so that's really where I live. And to me, that's the emotional eating piece where if you just diet and you take away the food, you don't have the tools for coping with life. You know, eating was how I coped. And I, again, I wasn't aware of that at first, but thank God we're having this conversation because some people are going to, they can't unhear it. <laughs> if they're listening, they can't unhear it. So you can start noticing like, geez, I didn't need that bread, you know, but I had it. Why? You know, and so food is our major coping tool. And if we want to lose weight and keep it off, and have more peace around food, we're going to have to have new tools. Okay. And so the, the key is, I mean, of course, exercise is great, but I could never exercise as much as I overate. You know, you get me around Hershey's kisses. I mean, the bag's gone. You we get me around Ben yeah. and Jerry's, the pints. I mean, I don't, I take the lid off and I get a spoon like, hello. So it's really important that we realize it's not just as not good enough to have nutritional knowledge or knowledge about what's good for us. And, and even to exercise, even though exercise is great, but exercising for weight loss that you're going to run out of steam, you know, on that, and that front, if you don't address the emotional eating. So for me, it's finding new tools for dealing with stress and with life. Okay. Cause when eating has been our major go-to and we take that food away on a diet, you know, from diet dieting, that's going to last for two weeks or so. And then we're going to be like, I, I'm crawling the walls. I got to have my food again. So we have to, we have to deal with that craving for the comfort of food. And to me, that comes from having new ways to deal with stress and emotions. And that's really what it takes is kind of having a whole new set of tools in your toolkit where it's not just food as your go-to, but you have new things you can turn to, you know, that can help you deal with life and also new ways of orienting yourself to life. Because my experience is emotional eaters aren't just people who eat over their emotions. They're also people who deal with life in very specific ways based on their past. Okay. So most emotional eaters I know have had trauma in their past. They just have, you know, they're no stranger to trauma, either from alcoholism is, you know, in their family or some kind of dysregulation. And for me, I used, I was sexually abused as a kid. Like I used food early on to get by again as a coping tool. 
And that's, it's so, it was so ingrained in me. I was going to need new tools in order to get by in life where I, I didn't all of a sudden get to that point where I was craving so bad. I just had to break down and eat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because, you know, you mentioned comfort food. Well, and those are the foods that we turn to. When yeah. We're feeling the stress. We're feeling something that makes us feel safe. Yeah. For whatever reason. And I can't help but wonder, because, you know, one of the things that we talk about all the time when it comes to mindset is the stories that we tell ourselves. And throughout our conversation, I can't help but wonder about the stories that I tell myself about food, because earlier you mentioned French fries and Mm -hmm. how you eat the French fries and how can you leave the French fries? And what came to mind was for me was, you know, I was one of four kids, you know, my mom stayed at home with us, my dad worked, um, and there wasn't much money. So something like going out to McDonald's was a huge treat. Yeah. So what story am I telling myself about eating, say, McDonald's French fries, and how I'm justifying it to myself today, because I can go and get French time French fries anytime I want. Now I'm an adult. But as a kid, that was such a rarity. So it's almost like I'm, I'm questioning myself on, you know, the stories that I've attached to something like a French fry. And I'm giving myself something more of what I wanted when I was a kid. Yeah, well, it's definitely a habit that we start at a very young age, you know, food being the highlight. And that was true for me too. Like going out to dinner was such a big deal and so exciting. Yeah. yeah, I I had like heart palpitations throughout the day. (laughs) Like an anticipation. You're going out for dinner. And now it's just like, uh, we just do it. I mean, our kids have moved out. So it's my husband and I, and it's just like, hey, you just grab something to eat. Like you go through a drive-thru, you don't even think twice about it. Yeah. But my experience is, yes, we have those associations from our childhood and yes, that's important to look at, but it, you know, we, to change the habit, we have to, in my experience, change at a deeper level, you know? So it's, it's really, I tell people, my clients all the time, it's not about the food. And so my experience is, uh, you know, there's lots of ways that we, we, end up needing food for comfort or thinking we need food for comfort. And it has a lot to do with stress. So I teach my clients how to start their day with a morning routine where they're, they're kind of getting grounded and centered. And so, you know, it's typical, my experience is overeaters or overdoers. So we're constantly on the go. We're constantly caring for other people's needs. You know, we barely have time to stop and rest, let alone eat a healthy meal. And so doing something about that stress is vital. We have to go to the root of the problem. And to me, it's stress and also just really not wanting to feel uncomfortable at all, at all costs, you know, and food kind of soothes those rough edges, you know, and my comfort foods were sugar, fat, and starch, my favorite three food groups, basically. (laughs) Are there any others? Oh, no, you forgot wine. That's a food group. Um, But you mentioned that we use, you know, we can either use food to um, numb ourselves. And, you know, what comes to mind with that is that it's because we don't want to feel what's going on. And feeling is a very feminine energy. And the sort of the action, the doing, the exercise, the dieting, that's sort of more that goal oriented, which is the masculine energy. Yeah. And, you know, if, if I'm listening to you, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's, it's about taking the focus off that masculine energy, the doing, and, you know, refocusing into that feminine energy of, okay, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? Yeah. And it's uncomfortable. You know, I, from a young age, didn't want to feel uncomfortable. Like I'm like, that's for the birds, you know, and it was, <laughs> you know, it just wasn't, there were not good feelings I had oftentimes. And I had a good childhood overall, but I just mean, I kind of made an unconscious decision. Like I'm not going to, if it feels bad, I don't want to, I don't want any part of it, you know, and food would, would, again, it would sort of cover up. It would kill that pain, anything that was painful to feel, And that just becomes a habit, you know, like I'm just at all costs. I don't want to go there. 
Um, and so it's just really important to realize that we are sentient beings. Like we like feeling is part of life. And, and if you are constantly running from bad feelings, guess what? You're constantly, you know, anesthetizing the good ones as well. I mean, yeah, eating chocolate cake feels good, but only in the moment, you know, later it doesn't feel so good if you go overboard. So um, learning to embrace, I mean, it was kind of a childish like system I set up where I only want happy, happy high notes. That's it. You know, that's it. Don't give me anything below that, but that's not life, you know? And what I had to learn to do is orient towards all my feelings, embrace all my feelings and realize if I had some dark feelings, they weren't going to last so long as I had new coping skills. Now I'm no stranger to depression and I know how dark it can get and how long you can get stuck there. But my experience is when you have new tools of getting by that aren't food, like meditation and prayer and reading, you know, in uplifting spiritual literature, um, you know, talking to friends, talking to people who can relate, being in community with other emotional eaters. These things all are new ways of coping with pain, you know, such a healthier ways of coping than eating, burying our feelings with food. Um, that's how we can kind of build this new life that isn't dependent on food as our number one go-to and coping tool. So it's not easy. These are not like, you don't just, you know, hop, skip and jump through this. This is, you know, food was my teacher. I mean, I've spent a lifetime, you know, learning how to make peace with food, make peace with my body, you know, and with my feelings so that they weren't so, you know, daunting to me. And it's, the beautiful thing is I live in joy most days now. Like I just, I'm like one of the happiest people I know. And it's because I'm no longer afraid of the dark side of, of dark feelings and fear and, you know, pain. I'm not, I embrace it all, which means that I'm not living in fear and flight of those feelings. I'm not living, I'm not dependent on food anymore to cover up those feelings. And that way, I mean, I, I just, I have new tools, you know, and it just enables me to just, live a lighter, you know, kind of a, a more l- lighter way of being than I ever did before. Trisha, you mentioned that you work with your, your um, customers, your, your group on um, how to set up their mornings for success. What are some of those things that we can incorporate in our lives right now to help start our tomorrow off on the right foot? Sure. Um, you know, I do start my day with meditation. I'm a big fan of meditation. And a lot of people, a lot of my clients will come to me and be at first, they're like, I can't meditate. My head's too busy. Well, that's kind of the point, <laughs> you know, like, that's sort of why we do it. So, you know, people often think they have to meditate and just be like, oh, like all silence, all zen out. No, like my head's busy, but I always say if I go from, if my racing mind goes from 50,000 miles an hour to 20,000 miles an hour, that's a huge improvement, you know, so I'll take it. Um, Anything to slow down. So starting our day, not looking at email, not texting, not reacting to stress in our lives, you know, create a little morning routine, whether it be yoga, walking in nature, journaling, meditating, you know, chanting, whatever it is, create a little ritual in the morning where you can get centered, get still and quiet and centered because we need to build, I call it putting money, money in our spiritual bank account. Okay. We got to make deposits. So we have reserves that we can draw on later in the day because life is stressful. And the reason why 75% of emotional eaters have the hardest time in the afternoons and evenings and into the night is because we've built up so much stress throughout the day and food becomes our stress reliever. Whereas if we build those stores first thing in the morning by getting still and quiet, by tapping into our divine spirit, you know, then we can draw, we make withdrawals from that, those, you know, reserves and have an easier time because otherwise it's chocolate, coffee and wine, right? (laughs) You know, that's, what's getting us through the rest of the day, but starting the day getting, you know, kind of tapped in, tuned in is going to be so, so important. And, and it's so important, especially for emotional eaters, because we are so chronically busy 
you know, so we just stuff, we don't just stuff ourselves, we stuff our calendars with things running from here to there, you know, one thing to the next, you know, adrenaline rush all the time. And, you know, cortis, elevated cortisol makes us hungry, you know, it creates hunger. And then of course, if we're hungry, we eat. So it's really important that we start slowing down, you know, and making that, making ourselves a priority. Most leaders aren't good at that. You know, we don't make ourselves a priority and it's, vi it's absolutely vital. And some people are like, Hey lady, you know, I don't, you know, I got three kids, a, a barking dog and a lazy spouse. Like I don't have time for self-care, but it's really important that we put ourselves first. And then we have time for other people more so than ever. Yeah. Even if you need to, you know, if you don't have say half an hour in the morning to dedicate to your morning routine, even if you take a series of five or 10 minutes. Yeah. installments throughout the day a little bit goes a long way it really absolutely. does absolutely but it's all you know we all have 24 hours so it's yeah you know it, how we spend it and who we spend it with is is vitally important you know and it's really it's kind of reprioritizing ourselves and putting ourselves first which is not easy and oftentimes we're like oh gosh what a waste of time no 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 not a waste of time it's never a waste of time when you invest <laughs> in yourself totally Trisha, as we wrap up, can you maybe share your final words of wisdom and the best way for people to reach out and connect with you? Sure. I mean, I would just say to people, you know, uh, thank you for listening. And it's not about the food. So let's go deeper. Like, let's take a look at what it is. And you will, you know, like you said, it's never a waste of time, you know, to invest in yourself. It's never a waste of time. And, and what you discover when you go on that journey, like food is, it's not about the food. So let food be your teacher, let it guide you, let, let your desire to overcome your food struggles, which I've never met a woman who really didn't have a food, like some kind of relationship <laughs> with food. They wanted to up level, you know, whatever it was, um, you know, it's a worthy journey and it's, a, you know, of course you can lose weight. You can keep it off. You can love, you know, the results from that journey, but there's so many other results as well, which is just getting to know yourself better, having more emotional balance, you know, having more love in your heart, you know, for yourself, which just expands to other people. So there, it's, it is so not about the food and there's so many benefits that come from really going on this journey of trying to figure it out and get to the bottom of it. Um, my website is called heal your hunger, H E A L heal your hunger.com. And so that's uh, where people can go to actually take the quiz. If you're not sure if you're an emotional eater or even a food addict, you can take the emotional eating quiz, which is about three minutes and it's free. And it's on my website. When you take that quiz, you'll find out if you're an emotional eater or a food addict or somewhere in between. And, um, and then what, what you'll, you'll get a personalized score and then you'll get some, you know, sort of first steps. Uh, based on your score. So that's a great thing. I do have a podcast called the heal your hunger show. Um, so definitely uh, subscribe uh, to that. Cause I do a lot of talking about my own experiences of overcoming emotional eating. And I have, you know, sort of health, some interesting health topics as well, but, but it's mostly about kind of like, like you, the life journey, you know, the life journey, because it is not about the food. We have to deal with our living problem instead of our eating problems. So there's a lot of shows like that, just good uplifting shows there. And on Instagram, I'm at Trisha Nelson underscore. So Trisha Nelson underscore at the end of the N in Nelson. Um, that's how you can find me. If you're looking at connecting with Trisha, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of the links in there. And Trisha, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story. Thanks for having me, Lucy. It's great, great to be here. And thanks for just hosting this show. It's amazing. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at The Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by The Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Love is like a roller coaster.